So welcome back to round two, live Q&A, unveiling the impact of the regional banking crisis on commercial real estate. I'm again joined by Chris Henkel of Henkel Analytics. Chris has, again, nearly 30 years of banking, finance, and risk analytics experience. He began his financial services career as a commercial banker at ABL, um, or ABL Corporate CRE Middle Market and Specialty Finance uh, and Credit and Financial Risk Management Expert for a regional bank in Texas. Before starting Henkel Analytics earlier this year, Chris served as Managing Director at Moody's Analytics, a New York-based leading provider of financial intelligence and analytics tool in the CRE space. I'm Ed Haggerty, Senior Director of Sales at Comstack. Before my time here at Comstack, I was at Real Capital Analytics, uh, just before they got acquired by MSCI, uh, helping out running the Southeast region there as well, as working alongside of the uh, economists um, at RCA. Um, so without further ado, we're gonna jump into some of the questions we received uh, from the webinar. Uh, you know, we, we got a ton of questions. Thanks to everyone there for participating. And so we'll, we'll highlight some of those that we felt were most relevant to the topic. Uh, so let's get into the first. Uh, first question, isn't the biggest office risk with single tenant buildings? And I think if we go on to the next slide, you know, the answer here is, is yes and no, right? Um, single tenant properties tend to be in suburban, uh, almost exclusively in suburban uh, areas versus major, you know, CBDs. And uh, what we've seen since the onset of COVID is a lot of uh, exodus from CBDs into the suburban areas. So, you know, a lot of those single tenant uh, properties, while offices down again across the board, um, you know, they're not going to be as impacted as, let's say, multi tenant office properties in uh, in CBDs. Um, you know, this is kind of uh, shown by, you know, what we see in transaction volumes, again, all across the board uh, are down, but in CBDs, uh, they're down uh, further, uh, as they are even in, um, you know, multi-tenant buildings versus single-tenant buildings. Um, furthermore, suburban office is still being priced at a premium to a CBD office. It could be a couple of things at play there. Um, you know, I think that one of the major caveats here as well as building class, right? Class A properties are certainly much more attractive to tenants than, you know, class B or C, even those class B and C properties that, you know, uh, owners have gone in and been able to retrofit and amenitize those properties are, are far more attractive. So that's going to be a big uh, caveat there as well. And, you know, another caveat is that when you have zero tenant diversity, um, you know, it could be a much riskier asset, right? If that tenant goes south, uh, if something happens, they're downsizing, uh, you know, take a smaller footprint, it can, you know, significantly uh, impact your only source of cash flow for that asset. And so I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Chris. No, it's, it's fine. I think the big difference, as you're saying, is the difference between what you're seeing in CBD. So here we are sitting in New York. I mean, you're not looking at a lot of buildings like this one where there's single tenants. You don't have some of those risks that you would have um, you know, in, in more suburban areas. And then I think a big thing too is just differentiation, as you're saying, about how fragmented things are both um, by market, but also by the different property class and, you know, how, how new they are. So, and um, I think that's a big factor. Uh, another one in the more densely populated areas too, which we talked about on the webinar, I think it was May 18th, but um, was how the the subleasing issue so i think i mean it's not really directly related to this question but i think it is in a sense because if you do have a single tenant or you do have concentration in few tenants you're seeing a lot of when those leases come if they're already subleasing a lot of space when those leases actually come due that's likely they're going to be giving back a lot of that space so even if it's not single tenant risk if it's heavily concentrated you know if that if the cash flow is heavily concentrated in one tenant or a few tenants, then it's likely you'll start to see some of that space being given back. So there's definitely some adverse there. Yeah, absolutely. I think we actually saw that on the, on the West Coast quite a bit also. Yeah. Um, all right, let's move on to the next question here. What about the growth of non-bank lenders in the CRE space, PE funds like Starwood and BlackRock? It, you know, and I think that this, this is a great question. Um, we've seen credit funds really pick up steam uh, really since GFC, right? Um, 
you know, as banks started to tighten their belts post GFC, a lot of these credit funds came in to help diversify that lender pool, right? Not only that, but investors wanted to get some diversity in their own portfolios uh, against, um, you know, uh, different investments they had in their pool of investments. Um, what's interesting is that, uh, and this is a great chart for Prequin, you can see just exactly how much credit funds have grown in the last decade. Um, but even last year, the top 50 funds uh, captured about 244 billion uh, with a 20% growth from 2021, right? So still very much a, a growing sector uh, as a potential lender. Um, but that being said, I mean, regional banks held such a large amount of debt uh, uh, over the last year and really grew quite a bit uh, last year that, you know, I don't think debt funds can fill that gap alone. Um, I think there's just uh, way too much um, debt that they hold that, you know, credit funds still ha would have a lot of catching up to do to, to make any headway uh, in stepping in and replacing uh, regional banks. Exactly. I mean, just echo what you were saying. It's, I wouldn't be looking at hedge funds as an example, as here's the alternative to banks who decided they're not going to be doing as much lending as they've been doing. So I think there's still going to be a heavy reliance, um, maybe, maybe even more so when life goes and others starting to pull back on those regional banks. Yeah. And so that's actually a good segue into, a, you know, another set of questions um, around regional banks and the banking industry. And so, uh, you know, the very first question we get in this segment is what percentage of commercial loans are from regional banks? What lending sources will fill the gap? if regional lending shrinks or comes to a halt. I know, Chris, you did a really good job of covering this at the, at the webinar, so I'll turn Yeah, I want to pull up the slide on that. So this is um, this is as of the end of last year. So again, this is something that we already covered the previous webinar on the slide, but it'll just as a refresher. Um, so if you look at the right-hand side, there's an estimated five and a half trillion, 5.6 trillion outstanding uh, total CRE debt. And you can see about half, well, more than half of that is being is held by banks. And so that 2.8 trillion. So if you look at the table on the left hand side, you kind of get an idea of uh, the breakdown both by loan type. So you have construction, which may be a little bit of uh, you know single family in there, but you see construction, uh, just income producing theory and multifamily. But again, really drawing your attention to. So if you kind of say we've got that 5.6 trillion and roughly half of that is coming from banks. And of that 2.8 trillion, if you look at banks, who's kind of the smaller regional banks, larger community banks in that one to 10 billion column, you can see that's about 733 billion. And then you've got about a 1.2 trillion for really kind of what we're calling that regional bank space. And so again, that's where I think was, first of all, where a lot of this webinar is focused and what our, our attention is focused on is, you know, really looking at it from that perspective. So the subsequent slides and information that we have is really kind of drilling in on that particular space because that's also where you have the greatest CRE concentrations. Yeah, fair enough. And I think that, you know, harping back on what we just discussed around credit funds, it, it takes up not even 7% of the pie right here. Right. So, I mean, to say that they'll be stepping in, I think is very far fetched. Yeah. Um, but, you know, again, I think that, um, that you know, the, the, over time it may grow to, to double digits. Right. Let's go on to the next question here. It sounds as if the regional bank sector is very well capitalized and stable based on the stats presented during the webinar. Is this correct? Yes. Um, and there's just, these are all, we put these three questions, think at least three of them, all together because they're very much related. So they're talking about um, the basically the strength of banking, strength of regional banks. Um, and so there's a couple of things we put in here that I want to walk through just as visuals. But, um, you know, if, if you go back to, I think, two questions up, I'm trying to see that first one here. All right. Uh, okay. No, actually, go down. Sorry. And, okay. So the one right before, so let me make sure we're answering all three of these. Okay, so very well capitalized, stable base. Okay, so we'll talk about that in a moment. Next one is uh, what determines a healthy regional bank. So again, that's gonna be very related to that question, other question, so we'll answer that one in a second. And okay, so this one here, there's a lot going on, but this is an entirely 
different slide from what you guys had seen on uh, in the webinar a couple of weeks ago because since then this data has actually been updated to now include the first quarter of this year um so they're actually if you look at some of the highlighted ones actually even a little healthier than what we even saw at the end of last year so these numbers are entirely different and updated from what you saw a couple of weeks ago but really kind of drawing your attention to a couple of things on the left hand side we've got a handful of summary statistics so you can see the first two rows being profitability uh and then interest margin expansion i mean there's gonna be a little bit of compression there because of the cost of funds and deposits um but seeing a little bit healthier in terms of profitability and then what's shown in that black that uh, box there is again that that one space we talked about the smaller uh, regional banks uh in the one to ten space you look at 3.7 percent interest margin 3.6 for the regional banks, again, among the highest compared to the other asset class or the other asset sizes. And then a really, and then if you kind of look down to the other one that's in bold, the reserve to non-current loans, non-current loans are loans that are 90 days past due or not accrual. Um, and so a key thing to look at there is the strength of those numbers. And in a minute, I'm gonna have just some comparisons with what we saw during the Great Recession. So you have a little bit of context because this is really just a snapshot. But as, as a little bit of a, a teaser, what you're seeing in that left column of all institutions, that number is even higher than what it was, I believe, at the end of last year. And that 219%, that's telling us that for every dollar of bad loans that the banking industry has set aside, a little over $2 uh, in reserves for those. And that's then you also can jump down further to the bottom three rows and you're looking at uh, the you know very high levels of uh of basically capital. So you can see the total risk-based capital at 15% come the CET1 is at 14%. And again, you can also then see where it's at for those regional banks, but just the banking industry as a whole. So what I wanted to do, which is going to be a little bit different than what we had in the last one, is delve further into this because we did get, did get so many questions about the health of the banking industry and regional banks. We wanted to at least provide that context. And before we jump into that, though, one other thing worth noting is, and we'll touch on this in a little bit, is, um, you know, we, we saw the headlines of what happened this year. So there have been three failed banks this year. Now, never mind the fact that it's over, I think, $500 billion in total assets, but there's been three. So, and there's just shy of 5,000 banks now. So it's just a little bit of context there. So yes, the, those three large failed banks uh, did get a lot of headlines, have you know, created some concerns, and there is a cause for concern. But again, the issue that caused those bank failures were not related to commercial real estate, were not necessarily related to credit risk, it was, as you see a lot more on these larger deposits, just a different environment we're in about the ease of being able to withdraw uh, deposits. Um, and then kind of just a little bit of a mismatch of asset liability management. So it's less of a credit risk or a CRE thing. It was a little more nuanced that's kind of specific to those institutions. Yeah, and I think with SVB specifically, it wasn't even about CRE, right? right? Yeah, um, it, exactly. was, it was completely about kind of a, a poor hedge on, uh, on treasuries. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I think that, you know, and we'll, we can yeah, discuss you're this investing long term in low yielding assets. Yeah. And then all of a sudden now you have you have a demand on those deposits and you then have unrealized gains or excuse me, unrealized losses that become realized once you have to sell them. And that's you know really what led to kind of what we saw. Um, but I have yeah I keep going to have a couple of other things I think that are coming right after this one. Let's see. All right, so the next three sets of slides look just like this. Um, and I wanted to really do this to provide a little bit of context. So as a somewhat of an apples to apples said, let's take a look at just the banking industry as a whole today or at the end of the first quarter of 2023 and at the end of the first quarter of 2008. So the left-hand side, you can see the percentage of unprofitable institutions. 4%, uh, 4.5% four today was 14% in 2008 and i think it got as high as um i actually have the numbers in front of you i'll, I'll check in a minute but i want to say it even got as high as somewhere like around 30 percent um of institutions that, that were that were uh had a negative roa or unprofitable and then you can see the right hand side again same same concept we're looking at the average return on assets of 1.4 
um, on more than double of what you saw what it was it's going into the last bunch of prices. Yeah. So, and this is just looking at it from a profitability standpoint. If we jump ahead to the next slide, uh, we can also look at it from a credit risk perspective. So the right hand side is the total reserves to total loans. So that's basically how much that the banks have set aside for future uh, problem loans or future losses. And it's relatively similar. So you got like 1.7 to 1.5 times. But if you kind of look at what you're seeing on the left hand side, that orange bar is where we are today, which is again, that what I told you earlier. So for every dollar of problem loans or non-current loans, you have $2 and you know, a little over $2 uh, set aside in reserves. Compare that to going into uh, you know, the Great Recession where we had basically less than a dollar, less than one to one ratio. And, um, and then also looking at where we are today. So that's one that the banking industry from like anticipating setting aside reserves for future problem loans is in a much, much better state than we were in 2008. And you also can see the, just as far as total loans, the amount of problem loans is considerably less. Right, and I think that this is interesting because we went through this, yeah. right? Yeah, so yeah. now we were somewhat well prepared mm -hmm. for another shock to the system. And so this proves this out. I think there was a lot of articles around that this is exactly like 2008. Right. It's not. No, it's not. And you, I mean, you, we are starting to see upticks in delinquency. You can see that in CMBS is somewhat of an indicator. Um, but you are seeing a little bit of that. And again, that becomes very nuanced because you can say, well, certain sectors like office, retail might be a little more problematic than industrial multifamily. But then you also got to look at it more, as you were saying, we were talking about earlier. Um, are we looking at office and CVDs versus in suburbs? So we look at big box retailers, things like that. So there's a lot of nuances. And to just simply rank order it by, by a property type or something is really just service. But it's reasonable to assume, we'll probably get into this a little later, that the level of delinquencies, problem loans, charge offs are going to increase. Right. And that's just the nature of commercial real estate. It's been like that for decades, where right. it basically goes through very prolonged periods of benign credit issues. Um, and then you have these chunks of where then you have higher defaults, higher delinquencies, higher charge offs. Right. So I fully expect that we're going to see an uptick in, in credit, um, credit risk issues. But at the same time, like I said, I'm a little, a lot more optimistic now about it because of how one how loans have been underwritten in the past leading up to this right. and two how well reserved capitalized uh the banking industry is now compared to prior recessions right and i think that another factor that we did address during the webinar is loan maturities right yes it's naturally going to happen when you have such a large wave of loan maturities right. pending right yep. and over the next few years we're seeing you know quite an outsized amount of uh debt coming due. yeah exactly so and I think we have another slide on this. So I already talked about briefly, but total risk-based capital ratio for the banking industry, 15, over 15% today. Going into the last recession, we were less than 13%. And then just from a liquidity standpoint, two ratios, there's other ways obviously to measure liquidity, but two ways of looking at it. One is looking at like a loan deposit ratio. And so you can see that being quite a bit less now compared to what it was, especially if you look at kind of the core deposits, stick your core deposits. So, you know, there was the issue we were talking about earlier about uh, the chunkiness of the deposits, but from purely a liquidity standpoint, a lot different. Um, and on that, one thing that is making headlines, but I think is a little bit misleading is the, I think in the FDIC's quarterly banking profile, they talked about how we had the, the largest drop, it was like a two and a half percent drop, um, somewhere to the tune of like five, uh, 500 billion dollars in total deposits, uh, in, but held by banks. So you could read that and say, oh my gosh, people are starting to pull their money out of banks. But if you actually kind of break that down and look at the numbers under from that there's i think about a 600 billion 700 billion dollar reduction in large deposits that are being held by banks but actually smaller insured deposits are actually up by like a quarter billion dollars so um or at 250 billion dollars so it's it's just probably a little bit more of 
There could be a lot of factors to it, but I think another thing is people just learn that, hey, I probably don't want to be heavily concentrated with large deposits, you know, businesses, you know, high net worth individuals, funds, companies um, within one institution. So right. now I think that just creates another element that is an indicator of kind of some safetyness because now there's, if we were to, want well, to see that how this plays out, but if you look at like the percentage of uninsured deposits, so the amount of uninsured deposits, I suspect that number is going to start coming down from what we learned for SAC this year. Right. And I think that a lot of companies even started to divert, diversify their deposits yep. to different banks right. following SVB, right? right? Just to protect their assets. Yep. Um, and so that's not unsurprising, right? But again, it's this headline risk where you see something happening yeah. and there's a frenzy around it. Right. Exactly. When I just read the headlines, like deposit, you know, come, come the reduction in deposits. Well, last quarter, like the biggest in, I don't know what it's 15 years or 30 years or something like that. Look at the number, but you just read that. And then I was like, well, just keep reading a little bit further. Yes, it's noteworthy, but right. More to it. So the next question, what is the likelihood that more banks will default in the upcoming 12 months? So when I read this question, I first thought more loans defaulting or more banks defaulting. So I, I'm going to go with a little bit of answering both. So one is, I don't look at it from banks defaulting. I think the better way of looking at it is Failing. more bank failures. Yeah. And so I do have a slide in a minute coming up on that to talk about it. Um, and then, then we'll talk a little bit about actual defaults of on CRE loans that are being held by banks. So this chart, again, this is new. So we put this together uh, just for today's Q&A session. So what you're looking at with these orange bars going back over since 2000 is the orange bars are the consolidated assets. So if you said, let's take all the banks who failed during that year, let's add up their assets. That's what the orange bar represents. The blue line represents the, uh, uh, the number of banks who failed in a particular year. So the way to look at it is in the left-hand axis, you see number of failed banks by year. That's the blue line. On the right-hand axis, that's the total assets by those banks. So if we look at, you know, call this out a little bit. If you look at 2008, you can see there were 30 failed banks. So really not that many. I mean, considering that was really the kind of the peak of the, the, uh, the Great Recession. But it's really what happened in the years after that. Just like when you look at bank charge-off numbers, they actually came after that. So it's always a kind of a, a little bit of a lead indicator. Yeah, exactly. trailing. Right. Yeah. Um, so we had roughly 30 banks, but totally 1.7 trillion. So you had some of the very large bank failures. Walmart was in there, Indymac was in there. Um, uh, and then you see, look in 2009. So similar total of assets, about two trillion. But now you started seeing a lot more of the community banks, regional banks, especially those that were really long in construction loans. Um, and you had a lot of like impairment and securities. So that was a big part of it. So you can see 148. Then even in 2010, you even had more failed banks. But now we're starting to see some of these smaller banks. Um, but then you go basically through this long period again where credit quality has been pretty good, banks have been pretty sound. We've been adding, you know, adding capital levels, new capital rules, new accounting rules for reserves. Um, and that's really started to cause a lot more, you know, kind of led to more of the safety and soundness and just lesson learned from the last recession. Um, but if we look at where we are today, again, the total number of failed banks, the Lorena, is three, three year to date. So right. that's it. Uh, and we're in June. Um, and but recognizing those are three large institutions. But if we say, like, why did those three banks fail? It's kind of we talked about a little earlier. So you've really got to they're kind of it's nuanced. You understand that. Um, but if you want to say, is there some kind of indicator to say, is is this kind of the tip of the iceberg? Is there something else? So I got some numbers in front of me. Just give me a chance to pull this up. Another thing you can kind of look at as a um, as an indicator is there the bank the FDIC has basically their number of problem bank uh, problem institutions so right now their their total count of problem institutions is 43 as of the end of the first quarter and if you go and look at what that long run averages it averages somewhere a little over 100 per at a given point in time so on a, like if you say at the end of each year what was it well, it was it peaked at over 400, 
uh, as far as like an all-time high. And what and, was that? Uh, that was in, give me a second, I got the numbers here because I knew you were going to ask. Um, see, that was in 2009. Okay. Um, Makes sense. Yeah, so there the total number of problem loans, 2000, uh, problem, sorry, problem banks were 403 in 2009. And if you go just look at the long, the long run average again, it's somewhere just a little over 100. So even where we are today, that number is 43, which is even below the, pre, the recent pre-pandemic average. Right. So, well, and yeah. I mean, even just looking at this chart, it's, it's fascinating to see when you have, again, a lot of these headlines that are saying, yeah. you know, this is GFC all over again, right. you know, CEOs of major commercial real estate firms really kind of um, strapping in for, you know, what, what they believe to be a big yeah. downturn. Right. And then you look at things like this, and even the fact that we're below, trouble banks are mm -hmm. below the, the average yeah. in pre-pandemic levels, yeah. it's very telling us to right. what the numbers are actually set. Right. Exactly. And, and, and now I don't want to just paint a picture that says everything's all rosy and beautiful because there are significant risks out there. Sure. Um, we know that you have loans that are coming due and maturing, and these may be at lower interest rates. Um, so that when they have to get refinanced, you know, that's that could be a big, you know, big issue. Um, especially if you look at what type, what what are those loans secured by? If we're secured by all these properties that are in densely populated areas, right. and we address this too during the right. webinar in terms of a, a drop in DSCR, yeah, right? and what's the ability of these owners to pay off their debt? Right. Um, I think back to this question though, and what's interesting that we saw in 2008 and 2009 is that we did see this trailing bank failure um, following the number of total assets, right? And so the back end of that question was. Will we yeah. see more banks fail, right. right? Or to your point, yeah. you know, if we went and interpreted that way. Yeah. Um, possibly. I, I think failure is maybe, I, there's a lot of things that can happen poorly for an institution short of failing. And so like the way that what I'm working with uh, community banks and regional banks, I always advise, it's like, I want to make sure, it's particularly with my commercial real estate portfolio, that I have a good understanding of what the risks are. And you're doing some kind of sensitivity analysis, stress testing analysis, look at what ifs, because right. you got to look at it from, all right, what if, what's going to happen when interest rates go up? What's going to happen for their ability, like even on an individual loan, for like for that property to be able to continue to generate sufficient NOI cash flow? You know, and you really have to, um, there's so many kind of variables and things you got to look at. So I would be to have a lot more confidence. I'd say like, I want to know where, what is the makeup of that institution's commercial real estate portfolio? What is their footprint regionally? What is their footprint in terms of different uh, property types, different classes within there? So that's where I highly recommend, I was advised, like it is a prudent risk management exercise to do some type of sensitive analysis, stress testing, because then you get a better sense for, okay, how you know where are the risks do we have this visibility and what those look like and um you know then that'll probably to me that's a much more telling leading indicator um of potentially what could happen down the road because then you, you have to be a lot more proactive with that information yeah and i think obviously one of these this question one part of it leads into the other in terms of interpretation yeah right? um will these loans default right Likely, yeah, right. Especially office retail, like we mentioned yeah. before, and then that could potentially lead into bank failures. Yeah, exactly. Because there's definitely a lot of correlation. So if you start seeing, all right, well, once defaults start coming and delinquencies start coming, they certainly can come in waves. Because especially with the regional banks, community banks, because by definition they tend to be concentrated into certain markets. You know, they are the ones who are providing financing locally to their neighborhoods, their communities. Right. So. If you're in an area where you're long on a in an area where it doesn't have as strong fundamentals, that's a concern. Or if you're secured by properties that are older, and especially their office properties, and less desirable, less made, that's a concern. So I think those are you know really big things to factor in. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's go on to the next question. Can you discuss the prospects for bank consolidation and mergers in this space going forward? The answer is yes, um, and I'd say that a little facetiously because one thing that we can guarantee is that there is bank consolidation. So um, this slide only goes back to 2008, but if you even went back to the 90s, 
I mean, we had what 15,000 banks and like four trillion assets. Today right. we have less than 5,000 banks and like 24 trillion assets. Right. So the one thing you can, at least I can say with a lot of confidence is consolidation is happening, will continue to happen. You know, so, but I think again, another headline is yes, there are much fewer banks, but where are they coming from? So the smallest institutions, the community banks, those are the ones that by count are sort of consistently been disappearing year after year after year. Um, and just looking at, I got some numbers here on this. Give me one second. Um, so we've got, so the long run average of mergers in the banking industry on an annual basis is about 250. So that's kind of what you're seeing each year. And where is that coming from? Well, be for a variety of reasons, cost of capital, efficiencies, competitiveness, you're seeing community banks merging with each other, one acquiring the other, and then they become the smaller regionals and they continue to grow. They grow organically, they grow through acquisition, then they become a larger regional bank. And that's really what you're seeing in this slide. So there's a couple of things I want to draw your attention to. The dotted red line, that is the, again, that's where you want to look on the right axis. That's the count of all institutions. So you can see we were um, roughly around 8,000, a little over 8,000 in 2008. And again, it was, that's even half of what it was, you know, when I got into banking. And then on the right, you can see now it's at an all time low and it continu continues to drop at a little less, about 4,600. Now, again, the total assets are up, you know, considerably greater. But if you look at what you're seeing in these bars, the you're seeing an upward trend. So there's been a, and that's kind of numbers on the right hand side. So there's been a 44% drop since the Great Recession, a 44% drop in the total count of institutions. So you can say fewer banks um, in bank, US banking industry is just unique in that sense, a lot different than other countries. Um, but if you look at the blue line, blue bars, that is showing you by year the count of, you know, kind of larger community, smaller regional banks, and that's up 48%. And then if you go and look at the orange bar, that's showing you the, um, basically that mid-sized regional bank, um, and that's up over 50%. So there's, you know, 113 now compared to 74. 834 of the smaller regionals, community banks, compared to the 564. So the reason I emphasize this is, you know, to answer the question, is there going to be more consolidation in mergers? Absolutely. And you're going to still probably see the same trend where it's the more regional banks are growing out of consolidation of community banks. And then some of the regional banks are getting bigger because of consolidation with other regional banks. So, so I think a, a positive aspect of this, because if we know that the majority of commercial real estate lending is coming from regional banks, the one thing you could take some confidence in is there's actually, even though there's actually a lot more regional banks now right, than there was in that trend is continuing off the back community bank rate of uh, consolidation. And I, I don't think this is a phenomenon that's unique to any kind of a downturn or recession no. or bank failures, right? No. I think that and I was talking to somebody else about this earlier this week um, in my video. Yeah. Um, but in terms of just being competitive mm -hmm. right, with rates against their cost of compliance and regulations. Yeah, they're larger, they're the, you know, the larger institutions out there, in order for them to be competitive, they need to be bigger, right? right? Um, and so to do that, they're going to merge, right? Yeah. So it's, it's not necessarily bigger branch network for deposits. No, exactly. So it's not off the back of, um, you know, a recession or, uh, you know, a series of bank failures or even what we're seeing right now necessarily, yep. right? Because this happens just as a, as a matter of course. Yep. Exactly. Um, awesome. Uh, let's go to the next one. What needs to occur in the market for some of the local and regional banks to unfreeze and start making CRE office loans? Um, uh, well, I think we've already started to see it, right? You know, yep. there's some articles recently in the journal, um, in, in terms of, uh, you know, a lot of these distressed office sales, right? Yep. And so if that asset's going to be severely undervalued to what it's worth or what it was worth, mm -hmm. um, I think we can start to see some of these banks, uh, feeling that that's a safe bet to make, especially right. in the downturn, 
uh, where that's that the, the value of that asset is going to exactly. increase, right? Uh, and it's going to have a lot, right? Especially with what the plans are for these assets yep. in terms of amenitizing them, making them more attractive to tenants. Um, you know, and obviously banks are doing this type of underwriting, especially as tightening is increasing yep. to understand what's going to happen with this acquisition, right? Um, and then, of course, I think, and I'll let you address this, but but uh, you know, loan extensions, you know, uh, uh, term extensions, loans, right? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really just hitting on the same points you just mentioned. I think just uncertainty around valuations. I think that's until we get a little more confidence around there, we get a little more sense of what's happening in the interest rate environment, what's happening with cap rates. I think the Fed's either, you know, kind of hinted to or indicated that they may hold during the June meeting. And so, um, but they're still likely to have rate increases later this year. Um, so there's still recession risks. And so I think just until we get a little more, you know, confidence around where things are, then um, then I think that's that's going to be a, a factor. We know we already see in the data that there's tightening of underwriting standards. So it's because of those, like because I have less confidence in rent growth, NOI growth, downward pressure on vacancy rates, uh, valuations, which are really obviously related to that. It's now I'm going to be a little more prudent in my underwriting, but at the same time, it's like, well, if the availability of credit is is reduced, then you have some things that are on the books that are going to likely have to get extended, and so negotiations are working with borrowers. So a lot of conversations I've had with banks, that's a lot of what they're planning to do, but also just being a lot more prudent with their due diligence and you know the just basically the extensions they make and the new loans they make. But um, that goes back to my earlier point. Again, I think the more confidence I would have in the risks in my portfolio and whether, especially with what's on the books now, but, and also things that might be coming on the books, like then that creates potentially a competitive advantage because right. now you want to, I mean, it's, it's easy to underwrite a good loan when in good times, when debt service requirements are nothing, when valuations keep going up, when rents keep going up. I mean, it's really hard to make a bad loan, but you can kind of see when the tide goes out, so to speak, um, what happens. And I think the institutions who are more in, in a better position now and coming out of this, those are the ones who I think can, actually you'll start to see that competitive separation. Yeah, yeah, um, great question. Uh, let's move on to the next. What are constraints for extending the term of maturing loans? Um, a lot of what we were just talking about a moment yeah. ago. Um, so it's really that. I, I think, um, again, really just all those factors we were just, just mentioning. Um, and I guess one of the ones we didn't talk about in this session, we did talk about the last one, is CRE concentrations. So, you know, generally speaking, if you look at what like CRE is a percentage of total loans, CRE is a percentage of capital, community banks, regional banks tend to have higher concentrations than larger institutions. Right. So just by that, you have some potential constraints that even if you did want to grow, it's like, well, I also want to be mindful of how much concentration do I have to a certain, to one, to commercial real estate as a whole, how much concentration do I have to certain markets, certain property types. Um, so I think that in addition to the other things we were talking about, the next slide I think just goes into just, I think the big one is a lot of, you know, interest rates, because you do have this very interesting scenario where we're still trying to fight inflation, right. which was also as a result of us trying to fight the pandemic. Um, and we've already seen now 500 basis points in rate hikes during this cycle, in this session. So in all indicators suggest we're probably not done maybe not maybe it's going to slow down a little bit but that's going to happen so i think that's i think just um those are some of the risks there because now it's like are these you know borrowers going to be able to service that debt at the higher you know at right the, at the higher rates right and again with this low maturity bubble coming due it, it, you know it, it's becoming more and more difficult for mm -hmm. to hit those dscr standards yep exactly and the next one, yeah, I think I'll just touch on this briefly. I think you're going to do the same, but this is just, uh, this is something we did include in the last uh, um, webinar, but this is just an indicator that what we're seeing quarter over quarter when banks were surveyed, what are, what's happening with your lending standards to new loans? And unsurprisingly, you can see that 
there's been an upward trend as far as tightening the reporting. You know, again, so it's like, well, if I'm less certain about valuations, less certain about the economy, about interest rates, about cash flows, then I'm going to try to be more proactive in managing my credit risk and my exposure. So they're, you know, by definition, you're seeing banks, insurance companies, others starting to just, um, some are pulling back, some are getting on the sidelines altogether, and others are just being a lot more prudent. So this, again, that's... And this was moving in lockstep with the regional bank's share of loan originations right. over time. Right? Yeah. So it's, you know, naturally you're going to say things are getting tighter, standards are getting stricter um, as you're doing more of this, yep. right? So it's not unsurprising that, you know, there's there's a tight correlation here, and it's in my thought process is that it, you know the chicken or the egg, yeah. right? It, you know, was it that you know they started lending more and therefore they perceived a, a, a tightening of standards uh, when surveyed, um, or you know was there a tightening of standards in anticipation of more loan origination? Right. Yeah. yeah. So I, you know, I, I always find this uh, kind of interesting as well in the correlation there. Um, yeah, I probably spend too much time on this one. This is just a visual depiction of what we had talked about a moment ago. So, um, by definition, regional banks, community banks are serving their local communities. So they are the ones that, because the earlier point, they're not the ones who are financing high rises and densely populated areas. Right. They're if they're doing office buildings, those are usually in suburban areas. They you know, or they maybe have some kind of syndicated deals that are with some larger properties. But by and large, they tend to carry the lion's share of commercial real estate financing. And that's kind of, you know, indicative of what you're seeing here as far as like percentage of total capital. You can see 240% for community banks, regionals, over like small regionals, over 300%. And some institutions are well, well above that themselves. Um, so again, I think that is, going back to that earlier question, that is a potential constraint because there are, you know, Banks are it's one it's prudent, but also required to manage your security frustrations. Will banks see an increase in defaults from commercial borrowers due to the increased vacancy levels and higher interest rates? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Short answer, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, exactly. Right. And again, this is something that we addressed um, you know, intently during the webinar. Um, you know, if if they don't have any cash flow from that asset, uh, you know, they're not going to be able to meet those DSCR covenants. If they can't meet those DSCR covenants um, and they go to, uh, you know, renew or refinance that loan, you're going to get yep. stuck in a high interest rate environment. If you had a fixed rate of 4%, it's going up yep. 50%, you know, your, your DSCR is plummeting, mm -hmm. right? Um, especially as a lot of these tenants start to reduce their footprint um, and as some of these tenants start to, you know, go full remote. I mean, that being said, right, yeah. silver lining to all of this is that anecdotally, we're seeing a lot more companies, especially in urban areas, uh, move back into a hybrid work mm -hmm. model, move into, you know, potentially full on-site work model, yep. and slightly moving away from the remote model. Right. And that's where the nuances are so important, because, yes, if we just said, let's go look at the banking industry or regional banks, do I think the delinquency rates are going to go up? Yes. Do I think problem loans are going to go up? Yes. Charge offs? Yes. But now it's like, okay, now if we want to really create some dispersion in that answer, it's like, well, first of all, tell me what type of loans you have. Right. How big are those loans? What markets are you in? What what underlying properties? Who are the tenants of those properties? You know, and that's again, that goes back to that kind of exercise that that's you, you really get a sense for what's actually happening. And this next slide, we put this up there, is um, is just you know a very oversimplified way to kind of answer that question. So again, this was from the the uh, prior um, prior webinar. But these three different scenarios, we were just looking at. Okay, well, what happens all else being equal to the debt service coverage? So you can see scenario A: interest rate four percent, DSCR one point six times goes up 350 basis points, 1.1, basically getting to breaking even at one time at uh, 850 basis points. And that's under a very big, probably not really valid assumption that assumes that NOI even stays flat. So because the, the, the question that the uh, participant asked was about vacancy rates, well, um, again, it's gonna be various and it's nuanced, but um, 
certainly with the office sector, and you're seeing that to be a factor, but also uh, the ability, the rent growth. So even if asking rents, especially in even in office properties, and uh, are are still kind of buoyed a little bit, the the gap that we're seeing between asking rent and effective rent right. is is massive. Massive. Yeah. Yeah. And so that I think is a, is another big factor to take into consideration, and that's. Just on the right hand side, this is a this is how empirically it plays out, but this is kind of a stylized chart, just indicating the kind of non-linear curve and the relationship you can see between observer default rates or default probabilities and debt service coverage. So as you, as you start moving a little bit more and more to the left, which could be from higher interest rates, could right. be from the rent concessions, rent growth, vacancy rates, expenses. Like that's you start to see an exponential uptick in default risk. Right. Absolutely. And I think that you're again getting back to what you said, it really depends on what, yeah. right? If we're right. talking about office, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, right. Exactly. And we see that uh, as we look at this data daily, you know, office net effective rent versus office starting rent, even. I mean, forget about asking rent, mm -hmm. is drastically different, yeah. especially in major metros, yeah. right? But then you look at something like industrial yeah. and it's not, you know, right. and they are seeing increases in uh, net effective rents over time. Yeah. Um, as well as, you know, pretty insane rent yeah. bumps over time as well in that sector. Yeah. I'll tell you the industrial is a little uh, maybe anecdotal evidence, but so the reason I'm actually sitting in the office with you today in, in Manhattan versus last time I did this, I was in my house in Austin, is because I completed a 1900 mile road trip from Austin to here. And it was a very, very, very long road trip. But when I was driving, I was amazed, especially going through like the Southeast and the East Coast, how many industrial distribution centers and warehouses are either brand new or being constructed. And then when I looked at the data and how many are scheduled for completion this year and next year is to me, I was like, okay, I haven't seen all the data yet, but knowing that if I didn't know anything else, that to me is a concern because you now may have companies, retailers, you know, who are saying, hey, I'm not, I want to have less space because I'm not going to go hold as much inventory. Right. And at the same time, when the supply of square footage coming online is just, you might see a bit of a mismatch. Yeah. Right? It's what we saw in multifamily in a lot of areas. We have to look at the growth yeah. of e-commerce too, yeah. right? Like yeah. what is that actually, how is that a lead indicator to justify the, the construction of, and on top of that, what I've been hearing a lot anecdotally um, with some of my team is conversion of freestanding big box retail yeah. to funk, right? You think Bed Bath & Beyond, you think, yeah. you know, any Home Depot that may be mm -hmm. reaching a, a lease expiration, uh, converting those to last mile yeah. logistics right. centers. That. Which is again just this this rush to it feels a lot like multi family mm -hmm. honestly yep um, like we did a couple of years ago yeah uh, on that note multi family do you think the conversion of office to multi family will solve the CRE banking crisis and housing shortage uh, I don't think so um, and I think that uh, we did uh, some analysis and thought around this I read a little bit about this I think there's only really one instance. In Manhattan, but I know of in Fidei where they're converting an old office mm -hmm. into multifamily. And again, it has to be some B and C class office that is really not getting any cash flow, that is really on the verge of collapse, where that owner will sell that asset right. um, at a severe discount to even justify the cost of repurposing that right. asset. And I think that what what the market consensus is is that this is far too costly to do right. to change exactly. an office into a multifamily property, you're just not gonna realize the gains that you hope from collecting rent uh, on that multifamily property later on. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I had some conversations, I was at a conference um, in San Antonio uh, about a month or so ago and talking to some uh, people who are developers, owners, and say that there's like, it makes headlines, it's trendy to talk about it, but in most cases, it's very cost prohibitive. So again, they're the experts in that field, I'm just looking at the data, we're not seeing it play out in the data so far. We're not seeing a lot of that conversion. So I think right now that's more uh, a bit of you know interesting headlines, but the actual conversions I think are probably much much fewer than 
what people might be expecting. Yeah, I think this is, you know, what we will see potentially is when those assets get to such a value that they could be bought at essentially the cost of the dirt. Yeah. Then you're going to see them being demolished right. and yeah. and potentially a new multifamily building being, exactly. being uh, built. What tactics do you see being most effective to the CBDs to garner pre-COVID occupancy? I, and I mean, this is interesting too. There was again this this article in the journal, yeah. which I'll cite again. Heinz bought this um, this uh, office building in DC. Mm -hmm. They paid about sixty mil for it. I mean, at a, at a huge discount. And what they did was they went and they amenitized it. Were yeah. able to secure a big law firm as right. a tenant. And I think that that's really the only play here, yeah. especially for these lower class properties is going in and being able to retrofit them and make them more uh, appetizing to the, uh, to the larger tenants. Yes. And I think just secularly, there's been a trend. So even prior to the pandemic, there was a downward trend in, uh, in people going to look at Yeah. And uh, that a lot of that has to do with just technology and with the type of you know, employment growth that we're seeing of people who can be working, you know, people who can work from different locations. So I, I think it's probably naive to assume that we're going to look at like long run averages of what they were is and, and say that that's kind of going to be, we're going to get back to that. Um, but to your point, I mean, whether it's employers mandating people come to the office or incentivizing them because the space is more desirable to be there. Um, I think you were telling me about Concert tickets? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, there were uh, raffles being held in, in our building by our landlord uh, to amenitize or rather to incentivize tenants to come into the office building, right? Yeah. Um, and they were raffling off concert tickets yep. to, uh, you know, to anything in, in MetLife Arena over the summer, right? Yeah. Which, which is pretty fascinating too, because it's not, it, you know, at the end of the day, trickle down effect, they're going to be impacted if ultimately Comstack decides yep. to, to downsize their space, right? right? Um, or any company for that matter, right? You know, so you want to make sure that your tenants' employees yeah. are using that space. Yeah. And so then they're gonna amenitize yeah. or incentivize tenants to actually come into the building, yes. individuals to actually come into the building. And if I worked here, I'm sure my daughter would be encouraging me to go to the office every day to increase the chance of her getting a Taylor Swift too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? Yeah. <laughs> Who are the winners and losers of all this crisis? This is something we went over uh, in detail uh, during the webinar. So I don't know if you want to speak to this um, or even you know potentially give some high level thoughts on this. Um, yeah, and I, I again, I think you can't really you can broad brush it. Uh, we talked a lot about it. I just think um, they, I, maybe losers for if we want to start pessimistic. We talked a lot about um, large office buildings, CBDs, where the the where the workforce is not required to come in, um, where they can get their job done, you know, remotely. I think that's that's a big area. Um, lower class properties, lower class that that exactly older properties that don't have the amenities. Um, right. I think that's that's a big one. Um, uh, there's big a lot of subleasing going on right now. So I think when those leases come come due and mature, then I think a lot of space is going to give it back. So I think the office sector, um, again, it's so fragmented, but cause again, fragmented by the again, tenants. Property location, location, all that. Yeah. But I think just if we were to rank order it, and this kind of, if you look at like CMBS delinquencies and indicator and other things, um, retail. Just, yeah. So office retail, you know, big box retailers, I think are, you know, but then you have smaller, uh, we talked about it. You've seen like a lot of these food chains that are expanding and popping up, especially in those suburban areas. So they're right. actually seeing some growth there. That maybe that's some of the winners. Um, I mentioned at the last webinar and just where I, I live most of the year in, in Austin is, um, and multifamily, uh, whereas for basically from like the early start of the pandemic for through like 2021, the housing market in, you know, for residential housing market, multifamily was just on fire. Yeah. And as a result, then you saw a bunch of high end new construction, you know, both residential, you know, houses, but also multifamily. And that's actually created now a bit of a, 
imbalance in supply and demand. So that once red hot market like Austin is now cooled off a lot compared to some market markets that I'm seeing here in the New York, New Jersey area. Um, so again, rank ordering, I'd say losers, so to speak, are probably like office and retail. Again, it's caveat the heck out of it. We're seeing hospitality rebound a lot. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and so, I think that another caveat there, right, is that all take all of this with you know not necessarily a grain of salt, but there's always something. Yeah. In the background lurking, and I right. think that hotels, hotels, motels have also one of the larger share of Roma charities coming mm -hmm. up as well, right? Yep. So it'd be interesting to see how that plays out over the next two years. Yep. Um, as those as that debt comes due, and and what these owners decide to do with those right. assets. Yeah. Um, on that note. Uh, we'll wrap up. I think that was a, a great set of questions. We obviously have some more. If you do have any more, uh, you know, feel free to reach out to myself, to anybody here at CompSac, or of course, Chris Hinkle at Hinkle Analytics. You can see um, all of our uh, social media sites there. Uh, and again, uh, thanks to all who were able to join. Um, we really enjoyed doing this. Uh, I know it was a great research exercise for me. Um, and I am uh, um, I'm happy that we uh, we got to address this. Yeah, and I, I want to say again, thank you to everybody who, who attended this webinar, attended the last one, and many of you who reached out to me uh, in between the two, because um, just getting these questions, it forces me to think a little bit, and also I learn, because everyone who are, we're all, everyone who's attending these things are serious professionals in one form or another, and they have a different perspective or different roles. So I always find these really insightful, especially because I don't think of a, you know, it's one of the hottest topics. So it's, uh, it's great. So thanks a lot. Thanks again, everybody. Take care.